Hey everyone, uh, I'm David Heidemar Hansen. I work for uh, 37 Sickles. Um, I'm also the uh, creator of a web framework called uh, Ruby on Rails, and I'm. Um, I'm not going to talk about that at all today, so um, sorry about that. Um, what I am going to talk about, though, a little bit is um, how lonely I feel up here. Um, so I work for 37 Signals. Um, we're not looking for VC funding. Um, we're, we're not hiring. We're, we're profitable. Um, and it feels kind of weird to be in a collection of young, smart people and, and feel a little bit alone in that sense. Like most of the talks this morning and most of the questions were, how do I pitch my VC? How do I do this? How do I do the other thing? That doesn't really perhaps relate directly to, hey, how do I build a business that's actually viable short of um, Google deciding to opening its purse and uh, picking me up? Um, I think there's too little talk among startups um, about just making money on their own. Um, so this is going to be a talk on the secret of making money online. But actually, um, I thought I'd revise that a little bit because at 37 Signals, we've kind of been accused a little bit of being arrogant. There's one way, uh, our way or the highway. So to kind of preempt that, um, it's a secret to making money online. There's probably other secrets out there too. Um, but I'm going to present the one that's kind of um, the one we've been thinking about. Like, this is the classic conundrum, uh, the slash dot question. You have a great application, and then something magical happens, and then you have profit. So we've been studying this uh, conundrum for some time at 37 Signals. We've been talking to a lot of people, been doing our research, we've been doing experiments, testing things out, what would work and what wouldn't. And we found out that um, having a prize it's really cool for getting profits. I mean, you have customers, they, they pay you money for the product or service, and you get profit. Um, and I mean, it's, it's such a weird notion. It's almost too simple to work. But I've heard that over time, hundreds of years actually, that has been how most businesses have uh, made their money. Um, but somehow, I think that notion got lost in the web world. Um, and the funny thing is, we played this game before. We played it back in 2000. It was all about the eyeballs. It was all about the uh, VCs and then getting bought out or going IPO or whatever. It didn't really work then. Now we're playing another round because there's money ready again to be uh, invested, money ready to, to buy out. Uh, social media networking things. And I mean, it's great. I mean, it, it, I really, I am truly happy for the people who win that lottery. I mean, just like I would congratulate anybody else winning that lottery. But I think there's just a simpler way. I think there's a simpler way of building sustainable businesses that are being neglected in the startup community, which is to have a price. And the cool thing about having a price is there's so many different ways to have it. It's not like there's only one approach to it. At 37 Signals, we have a really simple, dumb idea, which is just get people to sign up for a product. They pay us every month. If they continue to like the product, they continue to pay us money. And it, that works for us. Um, we've been more than doubling our revenues for the past um, many years. We've been doing this many, which is a funny thing in the startup world. For us, it's like four or five. Um, but it still worked out to be a, a multi-million dollar business. And we're pretty happy with that. Um, there's a lot of other people doing, doing similar things, um, just in, in different approaches to it. So they might not have a subscription service you pay every time or every month. You might be, do something like Campaign Monitor, which is an awesome service for sending out email newsletters, tracking them, who's clicking on what, who's reaching what. And they have this plan of just charging a cent per recipient. Again, a very, very simple idea. You're using a service, you like it, it's growing your business, and you pay to use it. They make money that way. And I hear, um, they're actually a, a cool crew down in Australia, and they're going surfing um, next week. A and I don't even think that they got any huge wave they have to catch. They're just happy making money. Um, <laughs> 
So you can also just do the traditional time-tested way of just selling your software. Fogbox um, has kind of two ways of doing it. You can either get it on demand, which is a new thing for them, or you can just buy the piece of software. So Fogbox sells you a package for a price, $1.99. You buy it, you install it on your server, and you're presumably happy, and, and Fogbox gets money directly from that customer. You can also combine these things. I love this service. It's called Fax It Nice. Fax It Nice is, is a great way of uh, routing around the fact that a huge uh, percentage of the business in the US still works over faxes. And faxes are really annoying. Um, but here, you wrap it up into a nice web service. You're going to send a single fax for five bucks. You can sign up for uh, a retainer type scenario, you pay 20 bucks, this is what I do, and then you pay a little bit every time you send, or you can sign up for a subscription basis where um, uh, you can send and receive uh, 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 faxes, and you pay on a monthly basis for that. Now, the really cool thing about all of this is you don't need to be a fucking genius <laughs> to make any of this work. It's not rocket surgery. I mean, it's really just that simple three-step idea. You have a great application, you ask money for it, if people like it, they'll pay, and you profit. Um, but here's the kicker. It's still hard. Just because you slap a price on something doesn't mean you'll have a successful business. Most businesses fail. And I think this is where the problem kind of creeps in. So if most businesses fail anyway, why shouldn't I go to try to be the next Facebook or MySpace or YouTube and get out for a billion dollars, right? Um, like uh, my good man, uh, 50 Cent, get a billion or try trying. Um, now, I don't think that logic is, is very good, actually. Um, and the reason I don't think that logic is very good is because the odds are not created equal. The odds of you in here making the next Facebook or YouTube or MySpace are tiny. <laughs> the odds of you actually just creating a product that a few people will like and pay you money for, not that shabby. Still hard, but not as hard as trying to be um, a billion dollar company. So I hear some odds. If you're building just a simple company, just trying to sustain a few people, what are the odds of that perhaps being a success? What, one to five, one to 10? I don't know. But the odds of you building that next Facebook or, or MySpace, it's probably not one to 10. I mean, if it was, I would probably not be giving this speech. I'd be trying to build the next Facebook. Um, the odds are a lot, lot worse than that. But people get into this notion that it's really this easy. We hear these stories all the time. The Facebooks, the MySpaces, and the YouTubes are broadcasted again and again and again. It's kind of like reverse terror alerts. So the probability of something like this happening, like the probability of you being crashed on a plane, tiny. But the fear you have of it, or the desire you have to be that next Facebook, huge because it's being broadcasted over and over again. You're being brainwashed. So, um, <laughs> if you look at these odds, and you then look at the, the probability and the outcome you can get for it, you can kind of compare them. So let's take like, a business where you have a one in 10 chance of, of making a million dollars. There used to be once upon a time where a million dollars was a lot of money. I still think a million dollars is a lot of money, but all these VCs are talking about is billion dollar companies or 300 million dollar companies. I think you can be, you can be pretty happy on just a million dollars. Most people would be. Um, and I think we lose sight of that because we get this um, image pumped up of the billion dollar company. Now to a uh, um, naive comparison, these should actually be equal. So a 1 in 10 chance of making a million dollars should be roughly the same as a 1 in 10,000 chance of making a billion dollars if you didn't care about the first jump. And I think that's what people miss. Um, the difference between having, say, a million dollars and a billion dollars is a lot smaller than the difference between having negative $10,000 on your bank account and having a million dollars. 
So I'd encourage a lot more people to take the better odds at the smaller reward and then perhaps worry about the billion dollars next time. Now, how do you go about getting that million dollars? It sounds, I'm even making that sound kind of easy. And um, in some ways, it's not as hard as you think. And I think it's because most people don't look at the simple facts for these things. So let's take the idea of a subscription service. A subscription service that has 2,000 customers at 40 bucks a month over 12 months make a million dollars a year. That's not bad. 2,000 customers out of the entire potential of customers out there, that's not a whole lot of customers. It's not really uh, that hard. It's still hard, but it's really not the same thing as trying to build that next um, one in a year theme, Facebook or MySpace or whatever. It's a lot simpler and it's a lot more tried and true. Dig a little bit further into those numbers. What do I need to get those 2,000 customers? Well, if you look at some numbers like conversion rates, let's say you have a run-of-the-mill subscription service and you somehow manage to make it good enough that 5% of the people who sign up for your service, they end up paying you money. You need to have 40,000 signups to keep 2,000 customers. That's 110 signups a day. That's still kind of hard to get, but it's really not that hard. And I think people are underestimating um, trying to aim for this. And these numbers even add up to a million dollars. Well, most people would be happy making even a fifth of that. If you go and take it down one more level, to make $200,000 a year, you need just 400 customers at 40 bucks. The market niches you can attack if you're trying to get 400 customers or 2,000 or even 10,000, they can be tiny. You don't have to care about these big waves. You don't have to care about discovering the next great thing. You just have to solve a problem a little bit better than the other guys. Just like um, if you're opening a restaurant, you're opening a restaurant, you're doing Italian food. It doesn't have to be the best freaking Italian food in the world. It just has to be kind of convenient for the people around you, and you can make a pretty good business out of that. I think there's too few people trying to make just a nice Italian restaurant in the web space. <laughs> now, how do you go about finding these customers then? Because 2,000 people paying you money is still 2,000 people. That's a lot, of, a lot of people. Well, we tried a few different ways. Um, and I think that's also, again, where it goes a little bit off track. So Backpack is an um, application we have at 37 Signals, and it started out being, well, we did Basecamp first. It was for businesses, for organizer projects. Let's do something for the consumer. Um, so we did this application for the consumer, or organizing their loose ends, blah, blah, blah. Um, really hard, because getting the consumer to pay you money for something that's pretty hard. We even had plans starting at five bucks a month. Um, and consumers are really fleety thing. They'll pay just uh, five bucks a month, one month, and then they'll decide they won't need it anymore. They'll turn it off. And it's really hard, actually, to establish a business here. Um, so I'd advise, if you're trying to, to follow this model of just um, selling services for money, um, going to the consumer it shouldn't be the obvious choice. There's a lot easier way to go about this. We kind of realized this over a few years of running uh, Backpack and other apps, and um, we relaunched Backpacks uh, about two months ago um, after it had been out for two years almost, and we aimed it towards the business instead. Well, in those two months, we more than doubled the revenue of what it had before uh, by just adding um, a few more sustainable customers who were willing to pay us uh, more than five bucks a month um, to use the service. And this is really something we have um, find that this is the market we're going to focus on. Um, not the tiny enterprises, but not the consumer either. We call this the Fortune 5 million. <laughs> There's a ton of companies out there in the Fortune 5 million um, who have a lot of problems who are not currently being addressed either because people were too busy trying to figure out how we can get everybody to watch a funny video on the internet next week, or about doing that enterprise uh, play where your customers are paying you hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. There's a huge untapped market here in the Fortune 5 million. Now, 
kind of the problem with all of this, and kind of the problem with attacking the Fortune 5 million, is this notion that if you're doing so, you're making a lifestyle business. You're making a small mom and pop store, and you're just going to be those two old folks behind the counter, counting the pennies, and that's kind of the life. And people look at you, yeah, that's nice, so you have a few customers, that, that's good for you. <laughs> um, and I think that's, well, in, in the... In the great words of uh, Eric Cartman, that's bull crap. <laughs> I mean, it's really um, not that notion that either you're going to be this sad mom and pop store counting the pennies, or you're going to be this billion dollar company. Um, there's a lot of room in between of just uh, enjoying life. Um, I'm glad that uh, Paul brought up the example of Craigslist, because I think Craigslist, in, actually, in that definition of lifestyle business, fits it very, very well. Um, being able to run your own business without taking VC money, without taking all of these things that uh, put you on a certain trajectory can be really, really satisfying. Um, calling your own shots, running at your own pace, that's pretty great. Once you get to that point of, well, the financials are, are, are fine, if you're making a million dollars a year, you're doing pretty all right. You're doing better than most other people out there. And once you've got that aspect of your life taken care of, there's a whole lot of other things that start mattering a ton more, like not being in freaking meetings all day, um, like not being told what to do by other people. Being able to set your own pace, calling your own shots, is immensely um, powerful motivator for just enjoying your life. Craig Newman, uh, Hark, Newmark, um, has a great quote in this, uh, in an article I read, he said, we both know some people who uh, own more than a million dollars and they don't seem any happier. I think that's exactly how the money game is. Once you leave a certain point, everything beyond that is really just not that important. And you kind of pick different ways to get there. If you're going for that billion dollar slot, um, you're giving up a ton of things that I don't think most people are considering. Um, he has another great quote of um, finding a good cause is incredibly hard and time consuming. So if you can find a good cause in just a business making a million dollars a year that you enjoy actually working on, why would you want to give that up? What's this overseller's um, intent of flipping your business? Where are all the people who are saying, I just want to build a business and enjoy it over the next 20 years? Most of the startup people I'm talking to seem so narrowly focused on we got to pump it up and then we got to sell out and, and then we'll live the good life. I'm not so sure that that life that awaits you after selling your startup is the good life. I've talked to more than a fair share of company founders who've done exactly that. I have one particularly sorry tale of a guy who was doing technology. I was talking to him about his... Um, his laptop and he was saying, yeah, I I'm probably going to get a PC next time because it runs Outlook real good and, and all I do these days anyway is schedule meetings. What? Are you want willing to, to trade being an active developer who's passionate about what you're doing um, for a little bit of moolah to, to get into that hellhole? I don't think so. <laughs> um, and the great thing about this is the notion that we have these big hits, we have the YouTube, we have the guys catching those big waves. It kind of reminds me of, of the movie industry, and this is not it. Business, in general, is not like the movie industry. There's no need to dominate the box office. There can be lots of winners. Just like there's lots of small Italian restaurants out there doing pretty great, even though there's lots of other Italian restaurants, there can be tons of companies out there who are just solving small, simple problems. They might have 2,000 customers, and now I have 10,000 customers. And in any case, most of the great companies who have been built over time started out with that. They started out with the 200 companies. The exceptions are the Facebooks of spending two years and being worth $15 billion on paper. Don't use that as your role model. But then you have, of course, the Sequoias asking, but where's the network effect? How are you going to be viral? <laughs> are you going to infect the entire population? Well, forget viral. <laughs> forget this notion of this automatic viral thing that will infect and spread. Um, 
You know what's right? What's <coughs> what's viral? Shoes. <laughs> Shoes are viral. When you buy them from Sappos at 10 o'clock in the evening, you get an email 15 minutes later saying, "You're such a swell customer. We're going to put you on uh, expedited delivery. You can have it tomorrow morning." And getting that box tomorrow morning and opening. The pack and think, hey, there's a pack of Pumas I just ordered last night. Just how many hours ago? In other words, just great service, just a great business. It doesn't have to be this ingenious idea. Often, the simplest ideas in the world, like treating your customers nicely while still asking for money for what you do, <laughs> can work. And you can build great businesses like that. So. How do you get started doing that? Well, I think people are tagging again this totally loop-sided. A lot of startup companies are thinking like, how can I ram out the gates? I have so little time. This is this magical market moment. If I don't launch within three months, we're going to be toast. <laughs> Sappers are selling fucking shoes. <laughs> People were selling shoes before that, <laughs> and yet somehow they're a great business today because they're just selling shoes better than the other guys. You can do that. So, how do we get started? Basecamp was the first product we built at 37 Signals, <coughs> and we developed it with a team of three people who were doing other stuff. I was. Attending college, doing some uh, consulting on the side. 37 Signals was a design business, having clients on the side. Um, so we didn't have a whole lot of time to do it. It was a side business. A side business is really not that bad. Having a limited amount of time every day to work on something, or even just having a few days a week to work on something, really focuses your energy. I had was actually doing con uh, contracting with. Um, uh, 37 signals at the time, I had 10 hours per week to develop Basecamp. Not 10 hours per day, 10 hours per week. That was the bill I would send to 37 signals. When you have 10 hours per week, those really matter. You can't screw around with 10 hours. Then nothing gets done that week. Having less time is really a huge benefit to most people. Because if you have all the time in the world, you're probably going to yank it off anyway, and it's not going to um, be really, well, yank it off in the business sense of the world. <laughs> you're going to spend your time or waste your time on frivolous features uh, that you don't need anyway. Another thing that's interesting about the whole Basecamp story, we grew Basecamp for a year before it was big enough for us to say we don't need to do consulting anymore. People are in too much of a hurry. You don't really need to build that huge company overnight. Most companies are not built overnight. Like that statistic of uh, seven years before an M&A happens, and I think that's even screwed. I think most businesses take even longer to become great businesses. So don't be in such a freaking hurry. Another thing, of course, just as a have one technical bit in here, we ran on a single server for the entire first year. The great thing when you're charging money for what you do is that um, scaling problems rule. Because scaling problems mean that you have more people paying you, uh, and then dealing with those issues, not a big deal. If you can, for example, just get 500 customers per server, you're having 500 people paying you 40 bucks a month, $125,000 a month. Do you care what that server costs? It can be the most expensive server in the world, and it wouldn't matter. Now, finally, um, take it easy. This whole startup thing, this whole rush thing, um, you're thinking about it as, oh, I'm going to put in all this work right now, and then I can just coast away from there. It's never going to get less work. The amount of work we did in the beginning um, was in some ways, it's just going to get more work. So if you set up your practices right now of working 14-hour days and seven days a week, you're just going to be stuck in that freaking uh, thread mill for the rest of your time on this. The patterns you set, the practices you choose to adopt when you're a startup will stick with you. Um, and finally, if you try this, like actually 
build a service or a product and charge money for it and it doesn't work, here's the awesome news. You can just blame it on us and save your ego like that. <laughs> this is a foolproof plan. You can always get TechCrunch to write up that 37 signals drove you to the Deadpool for charging money for your stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. We have time for a few questions. Uh, David, you talked about uh, opening Italian restaurants and keeping things simple. What happened with Ruby on Rails? What created the innovation? I mean, I, Ruby on Rails is awesome. I love it. I'm just wondering that you've talked to us about keeping your aims small. But I right. mean, I think that the reason why you're here is because of really the great achievement. So where does great achievement come in according to this formula that you're describing? I think it just great achievement comes from just trying to solve simple problems. Ruby on Rails is my attempt of just solving a simple problem, which is I want to enjoy what I work with. Um, and the continued evolution of Ruby Rails is picking up tons of these small optimizations, small of these simple problems. Ruby on Rails is really a small, simple solution. The first version was a thousand lines of code created entirely by me while working on Basecamp. It wasn't this huge mammoth project. I wasn't trying to get VC funding for it or hire 20 people or do any of these other interesting things that you can kind of do for that. Um, and even today, we've had, um, for the Ruby on Rails project, we have tons of VCs coming up. Hey, do you want to make Rails Inc? I have a few million dollars I want to invest in. No thanks, really. I think some things just work in the current conditions they are in. Ruby on Rails works for me because I actually have to use it every day to build something real. It's not the day job I have. It wouldn't work like that. I think having a day job as a framework designer is probably the worst thing you could ever do. Um, I don't think that's how, how good innovation comes. I think good innovation comes from just solving simple problems that you're intimately involved with. Um, so that's actually one piece of VC advice I, I heard before. Solving your own problems, great advice. I think it's the easiest way to, to, to kind of get somewhere. And just realize that you're not unique. If you as a company have a problem, you would probably find 2,000 other people out there who have the same problem and were willing to pay you for it. Can I just do one follow-up question? In light of what you've talked about, what would you have done differently from what you did before? With the company in general? Yeah, what did, I mean, in terms of Basecamp, in terms of Ruby on Rails, what do you feel you put too much time in or effort in? What, based on what you've just told us about, would you have done differently? Sure. Um, this is where I would need a moment to prepare such that the answer doesn't sound as arrogant as it is. I wouldn't do very much differently. I'm pretty happy with how things turned out. I'm pretty happy with the process in general. Uh, I'm pretty happy that we didn't um, listen to, to people who were telling us, hey, if you would just give your product away for free, so many more people would like it and use it. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, from your experience with what you call the Fortune 5 million, what kinds of businesses would you consider in the sweet spot of the Fortune 5 million, and what kinds of businesses would be outside of that? Sure. So I think that's a great question. What, what are the businesses that fill well into Fortune 5 million, fit well as customers to these kind of businesses? I think that when, when other companies, bigger companies, talk about small to medium-sized companies, they're usually talking about 500 people to 1,000 people. That's not small to medium-sized for me. That's freaking huge. <laughs> The kind of companies we're trying to reach is um, three people, five people, a guy doing something in his spare time. There's always going to be more of those kinds of businesses out there than the huge uh, 500 plus companies out there. And these people are just looking for simple solutions. They don't care about the legitimacy bullcrap. They don't care about whether you got VC funding or what. They just want their problems solved. <laughs> So if you're putting a great application out there that's solving a sliver of their problems for a reasonable price, they're going to just look at that and evaluate that and say, OK, I'll do that. I'll buy this, which means that you can get rid of all the other stuff that you would normally have to worry about if you had to sell into to the Fortune 500, where you really have to, to worry about all the red tape and the salespeople and the golf trips and the strippers and the stakes and the expense accounts and all that crap that goes along with that way. So it sounds like you're saying there's no business too small to be in the 45 totally. million. Oh, 
completely. There's way more business at the low end than there is at the top end, and you're going to be much happier for it. When you're dealing and servicing people who are paying you $29 a month, $49 a month, you're not beholden to any one customer. If you have a customer who's paying you a quarter of a million dollars a month, if they call up, you better answer. And you better do exactly what they say if you want to keep that account. Um, that doesn't, it's not the same thing on the low end. You can innovate on the behalf of a larger area of customers. I think you're going to be much, much happier for it. Hello, I got a fairly general question. Uh, being a software developer, I'm sure a lot of people here can relate to you. So, um, what, one of the problems I find is, you know, I'm in front of my computer 10, 14 hours a day. Uh, I'm supposed to be working on like writing code, but I find that uh, uh, I spend a lot of time getting distracted, surfing the web, trying to keep up with Rails. <laughs> um, what did? Did, did you have any similar problems? What advice can you give to developers to keep on track? What motivated you to, um, to really crank down and uh, crank out a product? First, you can start getting a parent filter. I think those are really good in the industry you're working in. <laughs> Second, I think the problem is you're trying to work 14 hours a day. Who the hell gets anything productive done for 14 hours a day? Try working five hours a day. If you only had five hours a day to spend on something, you'd focus your time a lot better. We've just gone down to uh, four-day work weeks. We're trying to work just eight hours a day. The amount of productive time I get out of that, what, two hours, three hours? I think people are just not willing to accept the fact that you can't, in a creative endeavor as programming, work for 14 hours a day. It's ridiculous. If you could just get three, hour, three great hours in per day, I would, you'd get a ton more done. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. <laughs>